Hello and welcome to Indus News live from Islamabad. I am Anid Parmith with the news of this hour. Let's begin with the top stories first. Germany says Kashmir is a bilateral matter between Pakistan and India and the issue can only be solved through negotiations. In a joint press conference with his Pakistani counterpart, Shah Mahmood Qureshi in Berlin, German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas said the resolution of the Kashmir issue is important for stability and security in South Asia. On his part, Foreign Minister Qureshi said dialogue is the only way forward to resolve issues with India. Iran has officially blamed its regional arc foe, Israel, for attacking the Natanz nuclear facility. Iran's state media says Foreign Minister Javad Zarif has pledged to take revenge from Tel Aviv for damaging Tehran's nuclear infrastructure. Zarif said Israel wants to impede the progress made to remove sanctions imposed on Iran by the U.S. Ukraine says Russia has rebuffed attempts by Kyiv to start a dialogue over its troops buildup on the border. In a statement, the foreign ministry called on Moscow to withdraw troops from the border and stop aggressive rhetoric. This comes after another Ukrainian soldier was killed by separatist artillery fire in the border town of Donbass. India has reported the world's highest COVID-19 infections today as nearly 170,000 people tested positive while over 900 died. India has become the second worst hit country, surpassing Brazil with more than 13.53 million cases. Pakistan has registered more than 4,500 cases and 58 deaths overnight, taking the tally to 15,501. Globally, the virus has claimed 2.93 million lives and infected over 135 million. These were the top stories. News in detail after a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now let's have the news in detail. We'll start from Germany, which says the status of Kashmir is bilateral matter between Pakistan and India, and the issue can only be solved by negotiations. Foreign Minister Heiko Maas said this while addressing a joint press conference with his Pakistani counterpart Shah Mahmood Qureshi in Berlin. Heiko Maas said the resolution of the Kashmir issue is important for stability and security in South Asia. He said Germany will use its influence to improve the human rights situation on the Indian side of Kashmir. The German foreign minister added Berlin is observing the ceasefire on line of control. Heiko Maas also appreciated Pakistan's role in the Afghan peace process. On his part, Foreign Minister Qureshi said dialogue is the only way forward to resolve issues with India. He said New Delhi should take the first step as Pakistan never shied away from talks with its nuclear neighbour. Qureshi invited international media to visit and witness the situation in Azad Kashmir in Pakistan and compare it with the Indian-occupied territory. Now moving on, Iran has officially blamed regional arc foe Israel for attacking the Natanz nuclear facility. State media says Foreign Minister Javad Zarif pledged to take revenge from Tel Aviv. Zarif also ruled out stepping back from high-level talks underway in Vienna to restore the 2015 nuclear deal. The Iranian Foreign Minister said Israel wants to impede progress made to remove U.S. sanctions on Tehran. Hours earlier, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu also said Tel Aviv is fighting Iran's nuclearization. However, he refrained from making a direct reference to Natanz. Now, for more on this, we have with us Mustafa Khorsheshem, a senior Iran affairs analyst from Tehran. Thank you, Mr. Mustafa, for your time. Now, Mr. Mustafa, tell us Iran has officially blamed Israel for attacking the Natanz nuclear facility and pledged to take revenge. Do you see further escalation in the Middle East? Come on, thanks for having me. Well, let's remember that this has not been an Israeli move uh, at the service of Israel, but it's been a joint venture 
by the United States and the Israelis. The U.S. has been uh, the beneficiary, the main beneficiary of this terrorist attack because uh, it reduces Iran's leverage on the United States, States in the, the talks in Vienna. And uh, this has surely been uh, one a ring in a chain of uh, moves by the Israelis uh, and terrorist attacks by the Tel Aviv in order to reduce Iran's bargaining power at the negotiations uh, between Iran and the West, of course. But uh, here is the very fact that uh, Iran would not let it go. I mean, uh, they, they uh, attacked Natanz facility last year. They assassinated Iran's top nuclear scientists, and now they've done this power outage in, uh, at Natanz again. This could have caused, uh, you know, some uh, devastation, environmental pollution. It could have uh, done much damage to the environment and could have uh, lost human resources and human lives. Therefore, this has been a major threat. I believe the Israelis uh, have already crossed the red line and Tehran would reciprocate in one way or another. Iran has the capability to re do reciprocals. Cyber take military issues, and definitely they would do so. Otherwise, the Israelis would be emboldened and Absolutely. Now, Mr. Mr. Mustafa, very interestingly, now we have that Israel's Prime Minister, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu, who has also acknowledged that Tel Aviv is fighting Iran's nuclearization. So was this incident deliberate to derail the ongoing talks with the world powers on the Iran nuclear deal? Mr. Mustafa, are you with us? I guess we lost Mr. Mr. Mustafa, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, oh, that's I fine, that's fine. Now, Mr. Uh, Mustafa, you, yes. you must be aware that Israel's Premier, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu, who has said the fight against the nuclear Iran is a massive attack. So do you think this statement will help him gain majority to form a coalition government? Well, uh, let's remember that something pretty well. After the Israel, because the Israelis claim they've been attacking Iran and Syria, 90, 95% of it uh, are lies. In the 5 to 10 percent that they've done anything against Iranian allies, they have received a response directly or indirectly, including the very fact that after one of the attacks a couple of years ago, Iran uh, transferred technology to the Palestinian groups who uh, widened their military power. And uh, from 45 projectiles that they threw at Israel in the last war, they suddenly improved their capabilities and launched 750 projectiles at Israel in a couple of days of war between Gaza and Israel. Following that, the Israeli government uh, collapsed because uh, of internal differences and disputes between Netanyahu and his defense minister. Ever since then, there have been four rounds of elections in Israel, and they have failed to score uh, and to form a coalition government. So Iranian reprisals come one way or another, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly. But I believe that Netanyahu, whenever he is faced with corruption cases, he tries to escalate the tensions with Iran. But this is not a tactical issue. At strategic levels, as I said earlier, this is part of the United States containment strategy, and the Israelis play as one part of this whole containment strategy to hold Iran's Iran back in its uh, nuclear industries as one of Iran's major power components. Therefore, there is no way out but resistance, and Tehran definitely would reciprocate such actions because it's, it is a strategic confrontation, not just with Israel, but with the United States, Israel, and their allies. Rightly, Mr. Mustafa, all uh, Israel's Prime Minister, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu, who has acknowledged that Tel Aviv is fighting Iran's nuclearization. So do you think this incident was a deliberate act to derail the ongoing talks with the world powers? No, as I, as I said earlier, it has not been a move to prevent Iran's talks with the United States. It's been part of the U.S. strategy in order to weaken Iran's hand. Let's remember that uh, the Biden administration pretended that Iran is not a priority for, its for his administration. But after 
uh, the Iranian parliament approved a bill a few months ago that pressured uh, the United States by increasing Iran's nuclear enrichment capabilities. Then in a sudden change of heart, Biden last week rushed to uh, call for talks with Tehran and they asked their European allies to call Tehran to Vienna to talk to Iran and uh, you know convince Tehran to uh, talk to the United States. Under much pressure, Biden took this action and prioritized Iran's dossier of five. So they are, they are trying to weaken Iran's uh, increasing nuclear capability in order to weaken Iran's stance in talks, not to prevent it, because they know that they cannot kill the knowledge. They cannot kill uh, the knowledge that Iran, Iranian scientists, thousands of Iranian nuclear scientists have developed. Iran has developed the facility and established and mastered the nuclear technology. Therefore, they may not be able to do that. What they are doing is just trying to raise the costs for Iran, and Iran knows the game and how to play the game. Therefore, I believe, to put it in a nutshell, uh, as the bottom line, if the, Uni if, uh, uh, the United Nations, if uh, Europeans, China and Russia, do not take action to stop Israel and the United States' aggressive and hostile moves against Iran, then we should see an escalation of tensions uh, uh, pretty soon, probably uh, around Iran after Iranian election, when Iranians can, with a new government can focus more on reciprocal responses to the Israeli atrocities and American atrocities. Rightly, rightly said, Mr. Mustafa, uh, rightly said, and uh, we could see possibly escalation in the relations now. Mr. Mustafa Kosheshem, Senior Iran Affairs Analyst from Tehran, thank you very much for joining us on Indus News. Now, moving on with other stories, South Korea's Prime Minister, Jung Se-kyung, says Seoul will cooperate with Tehran to solve the issue of releasing Iran's monetary assets. At a joint press conference with Iran's Vice President in Tehran, Jung said, his visit indicates South Korea's will to expand ties with Iran. Meanwhile, Iran's Vice President Ishaq Jahangiri called on Seoul to release Tehran's foreign exchange resources as soon as possible. He urged the Korean government to compensate for problems incurred on Iran in recent years with its practical measures. Unfortunately, the blocking of more than $7 billion of Iran's financial assets by South Korean banks, which has been obtained through the legal and legitimate sale of petroleum products and liquid gasoline to South Korea, has caused a decline in the relations of the two countries. Well, now, Seoul, their hunt eyes have been strained by U.S. sanctions, which caused drop in Iranian exports to South Korea. Now, India has reported record high daily cases yet again as nearly 170,000 people tested positive overnight. In the last 24 hours, the country reported more than 600 deaths, the highest figure in six months. Globally, the virus has claimed 2.9 million lives and infected over 135 million more. More about the pandemic in this report. As the nation scrambled to vaccinate their populations against COVID-19, new challenges pop out of nowhere. India has imposed a ban on the export of antiviral drug Remdesivir and its active pharmaceutical ingredients amid a record surge. Top Chinese officials admit that the efficacy of the domestically produced Sinovac vaccine is just over 50 percent. Beijing is now formally considering mixing vaccines as a way of further boosting immunity. Meanwhile, a real-world study has found that the South African variant may evade protection provided by the Pfizer jab as well. Japan has kicked off the inoculation campaign for its 36 million elderly people. If export from the EU goes smoothly, I understand that we can expect to deliver vaccines, enough for all the 36 million elderly people to get two doses each by end of June. We will closely work with local municipalities and will make our utmost effort to arrange inoculation system so that inoculations can be done in the shortest possible period. In Europe, Germany has administered 12.7 million vaccines so far, but authorities warn the situation is still very serious. United Kingdom Prime Minister Boris Johnson has warned people to continue to take precautionary measures as England prepares to move out of the lockdown. More businesses are opening in what has been dubbed as a major step towards freedom from the pandemic. I know we've had two and we're still going to be, be sensible, we hope. 
because we don't want another lockdown. But uh, yeah, no, it's great. It's really great. And more than anything, for businesses to survive through all of this, I think that's the, the real happiness in getting this place back up and running again. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says America has administered over 187 million doses so far, but the new cases and hospitalizations are increasing for the third week in a row. Now, the United States says China's failure to provide access to global health experts made the COVID-19 pandemic worse. This comes after the WHO said the data was withheld from its investigators who traveled to China. Secretary of State Antony Blinken accused Beijing of not sharing information in real time to provide true transparency. In an interview, Blinken said it is important to get to the bottom of the origin of the novel coronavirus. He stressed the need for a stronger global health security system to avoid any such recurrence in future. The top U.S. diplomat called on China to play a part in the reforms needed, including commitment to transparency and information access. Meanwhile, Pakistan has reported 58 coronavirus-related deaths in the last 24 hours as its toll tops 15,500. With more than 4,500 new cases, the country's caseload has surpassed 725,000. Out of over 725,000 cases detected so far, more than 634,000 people have recovered. The Health Ministry's data shows that there are currently more than 75,000 active cases across the country. The ministry said the Sindh province has logged the highest number of cases, followed by Punjab. Nearly 5,000 COVID-19 patients are hospitalized across the country. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan is set to deliver the opening statement at the Economic and Social Council Forum today. The Premier will urge the world community to take urgent decisions to respond to the challenges posed by the COVID-19. The forum aims to mobilize financial support for developing nations to recover from the impact of the pandemic. It is also aimed at achieving sustainable development goals and climate objectives. The forum will end on the 15th of April under the presidency of Pakistan. More news coming up after a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now moving on with the news stories in Yemen. The Arab coalition says it has destroyed six explosive-laden drones and a ballistic missile launched by Houthis towards Saudi Arabia. In a statement, the coalition said the hostile attempts are deliberate and systematic to target civilians. It added it is taking the necessary measures to protect the civilians. Earlier, Riyadh said it destroyed a ballistic missile launched by the rebels towards the Saudi city of Jazan. This coincides with intensified fighting for Yemen's Marib, which has claimed the lives of dozens of troops and Houthi fighters. Now, Ukraine says Russia has rebuffed attempts by Kyiv to start a dialogue of its troops built up on the border. In a statement, the foreign ministry called on Moscow to withdraw troops from the border and stop aggressive rhetoric. A spokesperson for Volodymyr Zelensky said the president approached his Russian counterpart Volodymyr Putin for direct talks to de-escalate the tensions. However, he said President Putin has not yet responded to the request to talk over the phone. The spokesperson also accused Russia of moving more than 40,000 troops on the eastern border. This comes after another Ukrainian soldier was killed by separatist artillery fire in the border town of Donbass. Now, in Myanmar, the ousted leader Aung San Suu Kyi has asked the court for an in-person meeting with her lawyers. Suu Kyi, who faces multiple charges brought by the military junta, has only been allowed to talk with her lawyers via video link. Her supporters took to the streets yet again to show their opposition to the February 1st coup. They demanded the release of political leaders and the restoration of a democratic government. An activist group says more than 700 people have been killed by security forces since the takeover. Earlier, the European Union accused Russia and China of hampering a united international response against the coup. Now, in the United States, protests have erupted after police shot dead a young black man at a traffic stop in Minneapolis. 20-year-old Daunt Wright was killed about 16 kilometers from the place where George Floyd was murdered last May. Angry crowds swelled into hundreds outside the Brooklyn Center Police Department building. 
Officers in riot gear fired rubber bullets and lobbed flashbangs at the protesters. Brooklyn Centre Mayor Mike Elliott imposed a curfew in the city, saying it was meant for the public safety. Meanwhile, the State Bureau of Criminal Apprehension said it was investigating the shooting. Now in Ecuador, former banker Guillermo Lasso has pulled off a surprise victory in the presidential runoff against socialist Andre Arroz. Lasso's win puts the country on track to maintaining open market policies rather than return to socialism. The National Electoral Council says Lasso secured 52.5% of the vote compared to Arroz's 47.5. The council will not formally declare Lasso the winner until after a review of the poll statements marked for follow-up. Arroz quickly conceded defeat in a speech very different from his combative tone during the campaign. But Lasso still faces a challenging task in reviving a sluggish economy marred by the coronavirus pandemic. Now, tropical cyclone Seroja has wreaked havoc along the Australian western coast. The storm has now weakened to a tropical low and drifted towards southeast coastal areas. The cyclone made landfall south of the resort town of Calgary as a Category 3 storm with wind gusts up to 170 kilometers per hour. It tore through townships on Sunday night, leaving a trail of damages and power outages. The Fire and Emergency Services Department said 70% of the structures in Calgary are damaged. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison said the situation is serious and the full impact of the cyclone is not yet known. Lockdowns due to the COVID-19 pandemic have disrupted people's lives across the world. But the Dutch government has allowed a few roller coaster fans to have some fun as part of an experiment to ease curves. Let's find out more in this report. Roller coaster aficionados in the Netherlands thronged the amusement park in Helen Dawn town. Only 2,000 tickets were offered at the park becoming the first in the country to reopen since restrictions were enforced. The catch is that visitors must order a ticket online and book a COVID-19 test before entering the park. What we hope to learn is to see if people are willing to be tested for a day out and how that process works. Is the app working? Does the scanning work? And what does a park do if the screen turns red instead of green? What is then happening in such a process? That's what they wanted to test. Some of the enthusiasts covered many miles to be the blues. Visitors say they are more than willing to endure no swabs to get their adrenaline fix. There are only a few of those special testing locations, especially for entrance. So with that, you are losing time to travel there. But as I said, five seconds, one annoying stick in your nose, and then you're having fun for a whole day. I think it's great that we can go to a theme park at all. Yes, I'm really happy about it. The park management says around 75% of the tickets were sold with reluctance to get tested as the key reason for the shortfall. Nonetheless, they are hopeful that this drop in sales will be a thing of the past once the lockdown is over. Now, recession drama Nomadland wins big at the BAFTA Film Awards with four honours, including the best film gone. More about the award selected by members of the British Academy of Film and Television Arts in this report. The BAFTAs this year drew particular attention for the diverse range of nominees and the significant rise in the nominations for small budget and independent films. The US recession drama Nomadland, about a community of wan dwellers, was the big winner, scooping the Best Film Award. The film's director, Chloe Chow, was also named Best Director, only the second woman to get the accolade in 53 years of the BAFTA history. Thank you, BAFTA again. Thank you so much. Um, we would like to dedicate this award to the uh, nomadic community who so generously welcomed us into their lives. Um, they shared with us their dreams, their struggles, and their deep sense of dignity. Thank you for showing us that aging is a beautiful part of life, a journey that we should all cherish and celebrate. How we treat our elders says a lot about who we are as a society, and we need to do better. 
Thank you again, members of the BAFTA. We hope to see you down the road. Outstanding British Film Award went to The Promising Young Woman, which also won the original screenplay Gong, while Danish Drama, Another Round, pick up the Best Film Not in the English Language Award. France's McDormand, the star of the Nomad Land, won the Best Actress Award. Film veteran Anthony Hopkins won the Leading Actor category for portraying a man with dementia in The Father. This is wonderful. I mean, I... <laughs> I'm at the first time in my life when I never expected to get this, you know. <laughs> I mean, I get, got to a point in my life and I thought, I wonder if I ever work again. That's the actor's nightmare. BAFTA also paid tribute to Britain's Prince Philip, its first ever president and royal patron over 60 years ago. At the award ceremony host, Edith Bowman and Dermoth O'Leary said the independent British charity is extremely saddened by the Duke of Edinburgh's passing. Now in business stories, European markets are retreating slightly as global stocks continue to surge for direction after record highs in several regions last week. The CAC 40 in Paris is leading the losses, tumbling over 2%. London's FTSE has slipped over half a percent, while the pan-European stock 600 have also shed marginally. Italy's FTSE MIB has edged up marginally, while Frankfurt's DAX is trading flat. Earlier, most Asian bourses also traded lower. With this, we come to the end of this bulletin. For the latest updates, you can always find us on social media at indus.news. Take care.